At almost 3,200 lines long, Beowulf is one of the most glorious and powerful poems in British literature. Its beauties are of a harsher type. The warmth and light of the Mead Hall are always threatened by what might come in the wild of the night. But the fragility of the community also gives rise to noble heroics. Beowulf was written sometime after the Christianizing of Saxon England, but before the Norman Conquest, so sometime between 650 and 1000 AD. The most probable date for this poem is at the beginning of the 8th century, and the story reflects the cultural transition of Anglo-Saxon Britain from paganism of a previous generation to the new glories of Christianity and the subsequent generations that wrestled with moving from an old pagan past to a new Christian culture. Beowulf is written in what is called Old English, which shouldn't be confused with Shakespeare's language, which a lot of people mistakenly called Old English. Shakespeare actually wrote in what's called Early Modern English, a form of English that is remarkably easy for modern speakers to understand. Beowulf is written in Old English, a a form of English, an early form of English that requires special training for us to understand. Though written in Old English by a Christian author, the story of Beowulf is actually set somewhere in the ancient pagan past. It takes place in Scandinavia, specifically the island of Zeeland in modern-day Denmark, and Jetland, uh, which is in southern Sweden. The hero is from a tribe of people called the Jets. It looks like Geets, but the the G-E in Old English is pronounced Ye, so it's Jets. Though the story shows remarkable invention and artistic unity, the author is likely using a well-known folk tale from the pagan past as the source for his poem, a story that would have been fairly well known to his audience. Before moving on to the poem itself, we need to discuss one of the most important aspects of Anglo-Saxon poetry, something called interlace structure. Interlace is a technical term used to describe Anglo-Saxon artistic designs of the 7th and 8th centuries in which thin bands would be woven together to form knots or breaks that interrupt, so to speak, the linear flow of the bands, one critic explains. The famous Celtic knot designs are the best known examples, uh, contemporary examples, of interlaced structure. This is an example of the great buckle from uh, what was called the Sutton Hoo burial ship. It was a remarkably a remarkable archaeological discovery of this century. Uh, a burial ship was discovered in, in the countryside of England, and it contained artifacts like this. Here you can see the interlaced design, uh, the thin bands of gold uh, that are interwoven uh, into, to form knots. And if you trace those bands, they eventually connect together. Interlaced design demonstrates complexity and vigor of design but also geometric precision and technical competence of the highest order. Interlace design was so prolific in Anglo-Saxon culture of the 7th and 8th centuries around the time that Beowulf was written that it even influenced how the Anglo-Saxons wrote poetry. The Anglo-Saxon poets consciously used a type of stylistic interlace in their poetry. They would weave together different verbal braids in order to create a dense, elusive poem that crossed the past with the present. They would also juxtapose, set next to each other, different threads of story and narrative in order to amplify the main narrative of the poem. The Anglo-Saxon poems who could write Latin describe this technique as texere certa, to fashion or weave intertwinings. In Old English, they described it they described it as wordcraftum wef, woven word crafting or word weaving. In short, for them, poetry was a verbal tapestry, a literal weaving together of words and threads of narrative, a verbal carpet page. To create a verbal tapestry, the poet would first create individual braids or ropes by referring to a single subject with several different words or, or phrases. For instance, toward the end of Beowulf, the poet mentions, uh, referring to the death of Hyalak, Beowulf's king, the poet mentions Hyalak, king of the Yates, beloved friend of the people, son of Hrethel. All of these phrases refer to the same subject, Hyalak, king of the Yates, beloved friend, son of Hrethel. They all refer to the same, to the same subject, but their differences create a verbal braid. This poetic technique is called variation, 
which one scholar said was the very soul of the old English poetical style. By intertwining two or more verbal braids, the Anglo-Saxon poet could create stylistic interlace. Consider this example. That was not the least of hand-to-hand encounters where Hyalak was killed, when the king of the Yates in the rush of battle, the beloved friend of the people in Frisia, the son of Hrathel, died bloodily, struck down by the sword. There are two braids in these lines. The braid of Hyalak, indicated by the bold words here, and the braid of death in Frisia, indicated by the bold words here. Was killed in the rush of battle in Frisia, died bloodily, struck down by the sword. These lines interweave these two braids. So what's the point of all this? There are two reasons it's important for the reader to understand interlaced structure when reading Beowulf. First of all, interlaced structure really is the quintessential aspect of Anglo-Saxon poetry, or Old English poetry. It gives Beowulf its somber, stark, inevitably tragic tone. The repetition and rhythm afforded by variation pulls the reader or the listener, as these poems were originally intended, they were oral poetry, the rhythm and repetition given by interlaced structure pulls the reader into the poem and pulls the reader through the story. But it also deepens the weight of the events. The poet doesn't just say, Hyalak died in Frisia and move on. This is an extremely significant event, the death of Hyalak for the Yeats, and the poet forces the reader to ponder its tragedy and its significance through stylistic interlace. The second reason we need to understand how interlace structure works is that Beowulf depends on interlace not only for describing single events, but for structuring the meaning of the entire poem. In addition to verbal braids, the poet also uses thematic braids that extend through the entire poem. He also incorporates numerous other historical and legendary stories, weaving these through narrative braids with the story of Beowulf. By juxtaposing, by placing one narrative thread next to the, th- to the thread of Beowulf's story, the poet can make important comparisons and contrasts between the two stories or characters in those stories and give commentary on the events of Beowulf's story. But without knowing how interlace works, the reader can easily miss the significance of these interwoven stories. As you go through this course, keep in mind there are no digressions in Beowulf. Every line serves its purpose. In the next video, we'll take a look at at important Anglo-Saxon social roles and how these social roles form thematic threads for the entire poem. We'll also discuss a few more important poetic devices and how they create the atmosphere of Beowulf.